Please take it away. I'll be moderating, but I'm also joined by amazing people who I'm going to call onto the stage to join me. The first of them being Dirk Vopberg, the lead of CS content at Spotify. Uh, John Wheeler, Senior Product Marketing Engineer at Envision. Maggie Appleton, Design Lead at Hash, who you just saw. And lastly, Ritwick Day, my coworker, Head of Product Design at Sanity. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we've spoken about sort of three key things at this conference so far that I really wanted to touch on. The first being creating remarkable experiences. The second, how does structured content empower us to create remarkable experiences? And third, and most importantly, how do we work together to make that happen? How do we work together to create the above two things? So I wanted to speak to real world people with real world experience in doing these things, challenges they've overcome, and how they've been able to move forward uh, in these spaces. So uh, specifically, I wanted to start with failure, because when we all try to do things, <laughs> we all fail. All right. um, and learn from it, hopefully. So I think about Simon's keynote, where he mentions all of these kinds of flat, disconnected experiences online, how we create, how we manage to create these sort of things that fall flat because our tools are disconnected or because we're disconnected, and Ridwick, I was really surprised that you volunteered to answer this question in particular, so <laughs> I would love to hear more about what happened. Um, I mean, mostly like w when, I, when I was kind of looking at Simon's keynote and like, you know, following along and, and trying to understand why he was so, you know, miffed. Um, a lot of what he was saying resonated with me. So I've worked on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, I've worked in, in situations where you know, you design this templatized uh, experience, which is, you know, fairly flat, but the content itself is dynamic, it's, which is done by a separate team working with a, you know, completely separate stack. Uh, I've also worked at the other end of the experience, which is, you know, you're creating something that is, you know, very brand-driven, very opinionated, very kind of immersive, but has nothing to do with that, you know, the, the, the other team or the other stack or the other experience that you just designed. Um, one example that comes to mind is, you know, I, I, I was working on an app, which, you know, I, I, that shall not be named, but designed, spe you know, specialized shoes that talked to an app in real time. You know, we designed workout packs uh, with these, you know, world famous athletes. Uh, you haven't guessed the brand yet, so that's uh, perfect. Um, but, you know, we designed these, uh, we, uh, we shot these videos with these athletes doing these workouts, and as a user, you'd put the shoes on and you'd work out with them. And you know, we'd have six athletes, six workout packs. But the thing we wanted to do in that moment is outside of these six pack of workouts, we wanted to be able to give people um, the ability to come in and like dynamically, cre dynamically create a workout for you based on your, you know, uh, your level of experience, the kind of duration of the, the workout that you wanted, the, the, the part of your body that you wanted to focus on. And this would have been possible had structured content been a thing back in the day, but it wasn't. It was like prohibitively hard and we had to keep these things completely separate. So we were left with you know, six workout packs instead of a you know, infinite number of combinations of workouts that we could have provided, but we didn't. So you know, moments like that where like this app experience or uh, you know, creating a checkout flow uh, that belonged to a parent brand that also had an incredibly immersive beatbox experience, which was totally culturally relevant, but the two didn't talk to each other. Like these were moments of like frustration that you know, I've personally experienced and I'm sure everyone here has also to some extent. Is there a difference between like those six boxes being good enough? I mean, was there a conversation that you had there of like, okay, we can't do the infinite personal customized experience. How did you decide that this was a sufficient experience, maybe not a failure, but? I mean, honestly, like we did as much as we could with the, with the content we had and with the resources we had and like knowing that taking this one step further back then, and when I say back then, I'm talking about like maybe 10, 12 years ago, would have been prohibitively expensive. Would have required like uh, taking the content and the way in which it was encoded and like chopping that up and creating a bespoke system that would let us then recombine them, you know, in, in ways that, uh, you know, would let us do the thing we wanted. But they're like, no, this is too hard to do, so we're just going to walk away from this. Yeah. And so, you know, leaving all of that potential on the table is incredibly hard to do, especially from like a, a design slash UX point of view is really, really like 
It's heartbreaking. I think later on also we'll talk about how do we get that ambition to do that kind of amazing thing, right? How do we free up the energy? How do we, how do we try to aim for that height? Um, but before that, I think, Dirk, you also volunteered to answer this question. Um, you've just <laughs> yes. come off of creating a new experience uh, at Spotify, but mm -hmm. I'm curious if you are, have a previous one that fell flat as well and maybe had some of the same issues. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, nothing I would characterize as disappointing or hopefully Simon wouldn't be angered by, by what we've done. But uh, as content manager of a customer support team also, I'm also sort of translating what we're, what we're seeing up here in terms of experiences, inspirational moments, uh, and that sort of thing to what we do in customer service. And there's still that idea of connecting to customers because they have such a myriad and almost infinite amount of combination of, of issues. So where we're at now, we are very flat. If I can sort of understand that term for me as being non response it's not very responsive to who you are as a user. Um, you could, you know, but we want to reach you, whether you're a 61-year-old in Peru or a 17-year-old free user in um, France or, uh, you know, whatever. And um, so we are short of that. And um, we really think that, yeah, structured content is the way to go because uh, to be truly responsive and truly, I don't know if you call the term unflat, and, and inspirational in terms of fixing issues, which I think our users would find inspiring, uh, that they can then get back to their music. Um, we definitely need that foundation of structured content is what we're deciding and what we're trying to get buy-in for at our, our uh, organization. I like that term of mentioning getting back to the music. As Carrie said, no one wakes up in the morning wanting to engage with a brand, right? They want to accomplish a task. They have some abstract. Yeah, that's goal. a very good point. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. Nice. Anyone else want to speak to failure or anything that sort of spoke out to you? I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> no failure. Going. Perfect. Well, the reason I wanted to start with failure is I think just to provide a counterpoint to an inspiring experience. So I was really curious about this kind of utopian way that we might think about the content that we put on the web or any other channel. Um, so, but I was, I think, still a little blurry on what makes a experience expi inspiring. So Maggie, actually, I wanted to think a little bit more about, hmm. I feel like you're very inspired by content generally. At least that's the gist that I got from your talk. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts or opinions about what makes an experience inspiring and how we can integrate it. Uh, yes, uh, when you sent the questions, I was thinking about this a lot. Like, what um, when we say we're trying to create an, like, an exceptional experience for the user, what are we really trying to do? And it's uh, to simulate what would otherwise be sort of like very uh, socially rich context. We're trying to simulate that there's some actual person in the interface. I mean, we always use this metaphor with interfaces that it's like a conversation with another person. We keep trying to make it behave in some animate way like it's alive. Uh, and I think I always like looking at places where this fails kind of informs us the most. You know when you get these stories of people are like, oh, well, you know, my Pinterest always just shows me advertisements for like maternity clothing when it's some like 30-year-old guy, right? And like that's the really funny, like something has gone very wrong in this system. Mm -hmm. um, but then it, should, it points to the ways that we can actually do it well. What becomes an exceptional experience is when the computer or whatever device you have is able to behave like it has a rich social understanding of your context and your needs and the data that you know, uh, not the data, but you know, the information you have and the situation you're in, where they can respond to that in a way that feels like there could have been a human there who understands your identity within your culture, right? Not just like it's projecting that it assumes you're some white 30 year old guy in San Francisco, right? That's always like the alienating experience, um, but one that actually is, is localized and contextual and gets where you're coming from and what you need to do. That's when you're like, oh, this is a really good UX. I feel connected to this application or this website or this brand. Um, it's, it's simulated being human really well. Interesting. So we want a computer to respond to us the way that another human might. That's like the dream. And maybe it's not like a Turing test kind of thing, but rather how do we react to each other and why is that valuable? Yeah, because we know it's not a human, obviously, right? No one's like, mm -hmm. this is like a genuine human like serving me this content that is personalized to me. Even though like Spotify's like personalized playlists are great, you know, I am not under the illusion some person is there like putting this together, but I still appreciate when it feels that way. I'm like impressed by the illusion. Mm, right, right, yeah. yeah. Or the effort put behind the illusion is almost human yeah. in its way. 
But um, yeah, certainly to the same point. But again, we have different material we're serving up. We're serving up um, solutions to problems. But uh, I would say that we're still going for something inspirational in a way. Again, um, something that really detects who you are and what your situation is. We're even trying to be predictive, possibly of your of your issues. What what is it that you're you have gone through? What's your listening history? What's your payment history? And again, it, this goes to uh, if you even want to talk about channels. It's like there's thousands now of channels of possible combinations of each person that you're serving up. And um, yeah, and it needs to be very specific to those folks. And again, I don't see it without us breaking up our content and changing that foundation for us. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, just to kind of add to that, I, I agree. I think what's also always interesting to me is that how does the opinion of the brand or like this simulated person on the other side come through. So they recognize me in the experience and they cater to me, but at the same time they have a point of view that they don't lose in catering to me. Um, you know, a, a very kind of oversimplified way of looking at that with the Spotify example is that, okay, fine, you're this Discover Weekly and you're presenting that stuff to me, and there's, but I see my face on the album art. I see that, you know, when I search for uh, a piece of music that you're doing color extraction and you color the page to look a certain way. That's Spotify speaking through the experience that they're catering to me. Um, so I think those little moments of, uh, you know, how the brand kind of remains present while recognizing me in the experience is also like really important, I think. I kind of think to the curation that Simon speaks to in his keynote, actually in the Prado store, right? That things are very carefully considered. Some a mind came and sort of tried to put these things together. There's this very curated, bespoke mm. feeling there. Yeah. John, I also want to speak to you about this because while I think you mentioned that you don't really work towards the end user experience, you do create tooling for people. You do try yeah. to create things that inspire <clears throat> people who are working in your tool. There's really two audiences that I create experiences for. There's that like external user, that's that person that's coming to our website. And my focus there is to try to create them an experience that they have no idea I generated completely with a content management system. Um, I think a good example of that is our freehand landing page. Most would go to that site and think that that's a one-off, but it really lives completely in sanity. And I think that that's really, really cool. The other is that like internal user who would work at our company and would be using the tools I've created to then build a product, or in our case, a landing page. And for that user, I like to think of Michael Scott from The Office. <laughs> uh, there is this episode where Michael has a surplus and he has no idea what a surplus is. So <laughs> he calls in his accountant, Oscar Martinez, to explain to him like he's a five-year-old what a surplus is. And I just think the whole explain like I'm five mentality is genius. And I use it when I am building anything internally. Because I need to build very complex tools, but I want to put the complexity on myself so that it's super intuitive to that end user or Michael Scott. It actually seems like two parts of the same coin, right? The front end user who doesn't know that structured content is there, that there's not a system in place that's serving yep. them this content, and then the editor who also doesn't realize that there's a ton of validation code or something happening to make this really custom experience. Amazing. Um, but I also brought you all together because I think you're all in different stages of your journeying with structured content. John, you just mentioned being able to implement it, but Maggie, you've also spoken to a way of structuring content in your own company now. But I was curious about what got you inspired with it. Why did you start thinking about structured content when building experiences? What, what brought this to the forefront of your current journey? Um, I mean, I think I was brought in, well, through the, I mean, I mentioned the semantic web in my talk, uh, I think five or six years ago, kind of came across the concept, and that was sort of my entryway into even realizing <laughs> that structured data was a concept, that the semantic web was a dream, and was really kind of sold on that whole narrative, and found it really powerful. I mean, the stories that were told uh, in the beginning when people wrote these essays about what could be possible if we did structure all the data on the web, and not even just on the web, even just within a single system, 
And the kinds of then user experiences you could build based off that structured data is, it's, they sound like magical, you know, to the extent that they could probably never exist. But, you know, it's like the data could be seamlessly passed around and you get these really contextual interfaces that understand exactly where you've been, what you have in your system. They have a rich, um, essentially, model of your world. Um, and yeah, I was, I was essentially brought in through that narrative. I've been interested in the space ever since. Um, but it's been interesting of trying to figure out how quite to engage with it. I, I ended up with Hash because they seemed like they were really going to be doing the most interesting work on it. But it's kind of great to have discovered this whole world of people using the term structured content, which I'm still like, is that structured data? I think it is. I'm pretty sure that's the same. Um, that are enthusiastic about it uh, and are trying to do really good work around it. Um, and it's like a new avenue opening up for people who have maybe been a bit disillusioned by the, the way the semantic web has gone. I'm also interested in the phrase modeling your world, because I also am thinking of your background in anthropology, right? Like, what is a language but modeling worlds? What is, you know, social customs but ways of modeling the world? Yeah. Does that inform your practice? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I'm very interested in tools that allow end users to create ontologies. And end users here could be, like, content managers or people within a company. But I also am kind of just meaning end users. Like, I really do mean the person on the other end of the device. And a lot of people will be like, well, that's never going to happen, right? The Michael Scotts of the Michael world. Michael Scott. I'm never going <laughs> to model their own data, and that's probably true. But I'm really interested in the power users. Like, I look at the people who are power users of Notion, and they build wild things. Like, it is incredible that they're not developers, but they are essentially doing development work with relational tables in Notion. It's just fantastic stuff. So this thing of you can have right, uh, low floors and high ceilings is a principle of software that's really great. You allow people to come in and do really powerful stuff at a low floor, but you also give them a high ceiling so that people who want to be power users can kind of go wild and really build fantastic stuff. And I'm really interested to see a user-facing app that allows people to do ontological data modeling and mapping that has a high ceiling, where you could allow people to go in and understand, like, oh, I can model my own world and then use it to program my own experiences and control my own interface. And I don't think that's beyond the realm of a, a lot of end users. Yeah, that's super inspiring, I think. And I also think that lots of people have the language for modeling, um, even if they don't realize it, right? And I think, Dirk, you speak to this too, I think, a little bit in building experiences. You've just started getting structured content with Vanity. You've just started entering this world. But I'm curious, um, when did you feel like you got it? When did you feel like you were starting to think about structured really content? Really think, yeah. yeah. Um, well, frankly, it sounds funny, but we've been fantasizing about structured content for a while. Um, and we just didn't have this, the tooling for it. Um, and that speaks a bit to, I think, um, a lot of what we're talking about here, too, is, is getting buy-in also, just generally at a, at a company uh, towards the idea of something abstract to most, which is structured content and so forth. Um, but um, uh, I would say even earlier than that, why would I be interested in structured content? Um, Spotify is very, obviously, uh, appeals you know, it's serving up a creative product. And a lot of the team there actually is very creative and sort of of that ilk in a way. And the way we were answering customers um, years ago was very, I, you know, I want to write basically an essay for how to fix this problem and serve it up. And there is, it did take some learnings to recognize that the word structured doesn't mean that your content has to become less personal or have less of a TOV, tone of voice. Um, but I think we had to kind of get over that hump a bit just culturally of, of what structured content means versus the personality we're trying to convey with our content. Um, and then now that we also have the, CM, the CMS sanity um, and we're talking to Carrie, Thank you, Carrie. Um, but yeah, now we're, we're full-fledged and we're in the midst of sort of doing our content model and getting that buy-in for the prio uh, to hopefully um, be able to build the systems to consume structured content. And that's the state we're in. Um, yeah, and we're very excited about it because we, I'm kind of repeating myself, but we really can't spring forward with the type of very real interactions we want to have with customers without this. And, so we're excited. I want to touch more on that buy-in piece. And also, I think, mm. maybe some resistance you might have met from mm -hmm. editors. But before I do that, John, you're kind of in the middle of fully blown serving structured content. Yeah, I mean, we're, uh. <clears throat> we're about three years deep into sanity at this point. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of evolved into the whole marketing site. And even as of recently, a little bit of the product. Um, if I flash back to 2019, 
uh, our C-suite had a one to two day like expectation to ship stuff. And I completely agree with that, but that was like not gonna happen. So uh, I knew we needed to do something like super disruptive. I knew we needed structured content for the marketing site. So after I got some buy-in, which we'll discuss later, um, I set up our Sanity instance, I made sure that our component library was super robust, and then we started shipping things faster than we ever had before. Um, now we can meet that one to two day expectation, and I guess pun intended, structured content saved my sanity. Um, do you have any place that you'd like to go with it? I mean, are you inspired now? Does it help you plan ahead for future initiatives? Sorry? Do, do, are you, does it help you plan forward? Like, is there, what's the next thing you want to do with it? What, what have you been in, sort of inspired to do since? Uh, convert the rest, and uh, I'm doing it next week. Congratulations. <laughs> Converting everybody else next week? Yeah, definitely. Great, amazing. So yeah, speaking of buy-in, I think you guys both speak to, spoke to sort of working with teams, which I also think is the sort of core part of this conference, I think that sometimes it's hard to get started with structured content. Either there's sort of cultural blockers, people are worried about their content being served by algorithms and not being able to make these one-off changes, not being able to have any kind of aesthetic intervention, or it's just really overwhelming. Being able to document the sort of universe of your organization is a huge task. So I am curious about how you got started, how you got people on board, Dirk. Yeah, so I mean, there's a couple of things there. There is just the sort of daunting task of the effort itself. Um, how much time will it take? Um, what kind of tooling will we need? And so forth. And then obviously that couples with, is this really gonna have impact? So um, I will say Spotify generally loves um, progress, innovation. They have fun with it any new tool or system or idea that comes along, Spotify is dabbling in it somewhere. Um, but um, it's also a very iterative company. They really like to iterate quickly, try something, see if it fails. So I think when, uh, before this conference actually, when I would be talking about how we want to set this foundation of content, that may feel sort of overwhelming and sort of a step back. Like we have to tear the house down, put this thing under it and build the house again. But I, I'm coming to find that uh, it, this can be an iterative process um, from the speakers we've seen earlier. The other really interesting th thing, though, about structured content for us is it's such a new concept. People don't even understand what it really looks like. And so what we're bumping up against, aside from the tone of voice question, can we keep the tone of voice that's distinct between how the advisors talk to customers, how the site talks to customers, how the community site talks to customers. Um, there's that, um, and, but there's also, hey, we're a customer service organization. We have all kinds of complex content. We have, so we have problems, we have solutions, we have troubleshooting steps. Can this even really be modeled? Can this even work? And this is even from folks reading the book. Um, but uh, yeah, we're definitely on a gr uh, good path because I really do feel like with wrestling through this content model, you can see how this does work for very complex content actually and, and, and can help with tone of voice and even expand the ways you can give a tone of voice um, by designing the information and not so much just worrying about how it's written, but how it's designed, how it's um, given to users um, so, yeah, but those are, those are the, the sort of um, conversations we have to have to really get that buy-in. But again, I think, we'll, I think we'll get there. Even when you mentioned things like having problems, solutions, mm -hmm. FAQs, those are just structures, right? Those are just things that people are kind of already thinking that I have separate types here. In right, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think sometimes you can read a book and you look at the examples and you go, well, the example is a shopping site but we do something more complicated than that. So the key thing for us to talk about it internally is think about the spirit of structured content. How do you apply the spirit of it to our unique situation? And you really get thinking and it's really fun to think about, but it, you start to see that it will work. Um, 
Yeah, but it's interesting. Yeah, I think the editor approach makes a lot of sense and also using the language that you already have. Yeah, right. And John, I think maybe, I don't know, don't know was, your, was your company as enthusiastic or eager to try new things or did you have to? I, uh, getting buy-in is, uh, it's incredibly hard and um, you really do have to start small, otherwise you're just gonna scare people. Hmm. Um, in the context of us, my manager and I, we got together, we needed to select like a starter project and we needed something that was like, not connected to a campaign, and uh, really something the users weren't going to read. So we, <laughs> we, select, we selected our terms of service, privacy policy, and end user license agreement. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's a fantastic starter project for us because it really introduced us to how structured content was going to help us and then that project snowballed into the next, and then it snowballed into the next, and that was just mm -hmm. like fantastic. Beyond like that, start small, there's really, at least in my opinion, I think there's three things that you can use to help sell it up the chain. Um, sorry, I'm picturing the VP of uh, sales at Sanity writing this down right now. Um, <laughs> number, <laughs> sorry, yeah, don't ignore me. Uh, number one, uh, how easy it is to write that data and whether through like a graphic user interface or an API. Number two, how that data is then stored. Are you using portable text? Are you structuring the content in an abstract way that it can scale over time? That quotes from my, my boss. And three, how easy it is to consume that data so that it can be output into your product or, in our case, uh, website. I think if you stick to those three things, write, store, consume, you're gonna see some buy-in. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, super concise. Um, but one thing that I also kind of picked out of that story was how closely you're working with your team, with your manager, like how much communication was there, how you were collaborating, I mean, maybe it didn't feel that way at the time, but. Um, okay, real talk. Uh, I think I kept my manager in the dark slightly about what I was doing for a few days. Um, but, I mean, generally my manager and I, we get in jam sessions, at least I call them jam sessions, uh, every day for about an hour and basically just shoot it and see what comes of it. And, um, I mean, I, I personally need somebody to tell me no which he does constantly. I have an idea and a vision, and I'm trying to like get that out, and then he challenges it. And I think that that's really powerful. I think everybody needs somebody to challenge you. And I think that's why we get to create such amazing products, really. I think also having that time is a luxury, right? Or maybe not a luxury, but something that we should make time for that feels like a luxury. And Ritwick, I think you mentioned, um, you know, being able to free up time for tasks required for collaboration, how do we sort of make that space for either jam sessions or more formal planning, anything that really helps us collaborate? How do we, how do, we do that? Yeah, this is something I dug into at one of my past jobs. Like, I think we were looking into um, speeding up the discovery process on Teams because, you know, everyone knew how to do it, but then sometimes the process kind of became a crutch. So, like, okay, let's dig into this. What is really slowing people down? And I think the thing we learned is that people didn't know how to collaborate. So if you fixed or made collaboration efficient, then you automatically free up time for all this other stuff that you kind of you know, feel yourself chasing after. And the thing we learned after talking to a bunch of people and just like sitting down is one of those things that when you say it out loud sounds obvious, but you know, doesn't like it has implications. So the, the thing that makes collaboration effective the single most important factor there is a shared artifact. And so if you are working across, uh, at one point I was working across 23 teams and you know, different disciplines, legal, you know, licensing and, and, and so on, and then product design and, and PMs and everyone, marketing, content strategy all together uh, on a project that would typically, like that was slated to take about two and a half to three years, right? And we had to make sure that collaboration was efficient along the way. And the thing that was slowing us down is because people had different ways of working and were not looking at a single source of truth. Um, so the thing we came to was, can we have a shared artifact that is the single source of truth? 
can we can this artifact be such that it is inclusive? And what I mean by that is, you know, some people like words, some people like pictures. Can we have something that everyone can relate to and understand at a very basic level? Uh, can it be a working document? So everyone can come to it, influence it, manipulate it, change it, and then walk away. Um, and if you have that, then the thing that you end up with is you have, you have a kind of shared knowledge of the single source of truth. You have, um, you have a shared language. So even though you belong to different disciplines across different teams, you are now using the same language. After like a few sessions of looking at the same artifact, you start to use the same words and you, your, your concepts, you know, it, it's not that you're pointing to a four-legged animal and someone saying dog, the other one saying cat. Like you know what this thing is. Um, and it builds empathy. So when you start to understand where the other person's coming from and a little bit about their processes as they're talking about this thing, uh, automatically things start to get more efficient. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I'll use probably something like a virtual whiteboarding tool like a fig jam or like a mirror or something. But this is actually one of those things, the, the, the collaboration aspect also is one of those things that drew me to structured content. It's, like, it's a new domain for me. But this whole idea of, uh, like Carrie and I have talked about this quite a bit, and she talks about this, this idea of a, of a, of a structure-first process. And you know, we've talked about content first, and we talked about design first, and like structure first, very interesting, right? And when I think about that, like I think about what if like these different teams coming together that have very different tasks, but spent the kind of initial foundational phase just agreeing on the structure of the experience, or the structure of the content, and once they aligned on that, they can now walk away and do their thing, right? Engineering can go build the scaffolding. Design can then go start exploring flows and the user experience based on the fact that this is the content and this is the experience and this, these are the pieces we have to work with. Uh, and it makes things so much faster. So yeah, kind of marrying those two things. One is shared artifact and the fact that structured content can be that shared artifact. That is like infinitely fascinating to me and that's something we're starting to explore. Also, I don't know that answers that question directly, but yeah, like let's shave off, um, like doing this thing will basically like free up a bunch of time and help you collaborate faster. I think it does answer the question. It's <laughs> like unlocking value, right? Knowing that yeah. this thing will make us better is certainly a compelling argument. But I also hear echoes of what you were speaking about, Maggie, and what Ritwick was talking about. Shared artifacts, shared structures, common language. I'm curious if you have a take on how you either get people to work in this way, if you have to convince people to work in this way, or what your experience has been? You know, around uh, structured content and structured data, like around modeling? Yeah, and, and getting, I don't know if you run into hesitation or need to also get people to collaborate and free up time. Um, uh, honestly, that, I'm, I'm gonna say uh, probably not that much in that I'm still privileged to work at a, a small company where we don't have, we haven't run into the issues of, I don't know, scale and like not being able to communicate across boundaries. I mean, there's 15 of us and most of us work in a single physical office together, which I know is a very unpopular opinion in the current situation, but being in person has made an enormous difference to communication and collaboration and all being on the same page uh, and shared context. Um, again, not popular, <laughs> but uh, the tools we have currently to get shared context are, let's say, limited, <laughs> uh, which is why, yeah, I, I don't know, tools that allow us to create these models or shared languages, that one resonated a lot. I don't know if sanity could kind of be obviously part of this, but getting people to use the same words even to refer to the same thing, um, <laughs> critical to just being like, yeah, we're actually talking about the same thing. We're not right. talking about random concepts. Mm. It's, it's nice for us, it might be, that content modeling, no one's an expert at that. In our, in our department. So there's no one, there's no sort of silo for that yet. So I think that sort of helps, helps us be able to talk together about it and learn it together. Um, and there's definitely a technical need. We already have, with the few channels we have, we have content that's not agreeing. Um, so, you know, we have, we have the technical desire to create very um, personalized troubleshooting flows and then we on the content side have quite an interest to uh, have the content and information aligned no matter how that content's dispersed. So um, I think with all of that, we're feeling like we're gonna come together and have that working group. And then the shared language and how we all talk to each other about the content blocks. I, again, I think that's kind of cool because it's, 
it's a new field for all of us. So we can sort of create it ourselves uh, with each other. Yeah. You've kind of touched on my final question too, which I think speaks to this sort of different, very specific workflows and also being able to reach across them. Mm -hmm. I think Carrie speaks to um, you know, engineering teams being on an agile workflow and mm -hmm. then um, content teams being left out of the loop entirely. So if I understand you correctly, it sounds like because you've kind of embarked on this new endeavor together that those silos don't exist yet. Is that right? Yeah, I think, I think we are feeling that pretty well, yeah. Um, it is, I mean, there still is buy-in all the way across, like what is structured content, what's that look like? <laughs> So, so we're kind of getting that buy-in at the same time that we also all recognize that we want what structured content gets you, if that makes sense. So, so um, yeah, we're, we're all together on it and uh, um, that we need to do something about content. And then it is a little, a little more talk about the particular way we, uh, we, we structure and sort of like that. But um, yeah, we're, we're ready to go, all the teams. So. And John, you're further along in doing this, so yeah, I'm curious uh, what you've done in the past. Well, you're talking about like cross team. I, I, I think that there's, I think there's two reasons that a designer and developer butts heads. Um, one, the design is uh, lacking, and the engineer knows it. Or two. Uh, the design's awesome and the engineer doesn't know how to implement it or doesn't have the system to implement it. And I think that's why it's so important that you invite and involve uh, your engineer or yeah. designer early and often into your process. Um, so it, it, like in my role, I have to foresee all these different scenarios that might arise. For example, I might get this beautiful hero design, but the headline is five words, and it's perfect with five words, but I damn well know content's gonna come in and try to shove a book into that headline space. And like, so we have to solve for that. How do we solve for that? Well, maybe the solve is we drop the font size by 20 or 30% if the headline hits X amount of characters. And so those things take time, and they need to be addressed. So that's why it's, it's just so important to meet early and often with everybody so that everybody's needs can be met. Yeah. Do you think that there, is there value in that conversation with the content person who wants to write a book in a headline? I mean, is there, is there maybe a way to sort of semantically approach that or, or think about what needs to be dropped? I guess that's also mm -hmm. a conversation that you have after the fact, right? Like, what can we do to make Yeah, I mean, I don't like to, I, I would say that when I get together with my designer, I make sure that they are flexible. Mm. Like, don't give me a five-word headline. It needs to be flexible because we know it's going to change, and that applies to like so many things. I'm just using text as a, as a you know, for the content. But um, yeah, involve content, sure. But content's probably going to come to you and say, yeah, I might change it at the last minute. They're gonna. So, right? Um, yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's part of why we structure it, right? So that we can make it flexible. We can swap things in and out. We can. Yeah, I mean, like some of the tools I have to create. I mean, I have designers that that come up with these, like, I'll be honest, like print layouts, but they're supposed to be, like, for a digital experience that's responsive to different screen sizes. But they want it to look like a poster, and so I have to build tools that, on the fly, I can adjust how that text outputs uh, perfectly. Uh, and breaks at the right places, and it's annoying, but I do it because I love it. Yeah, and it's iterative, and you keep learning, and you keep sort of making it better. Yes. Which I think is all we can hope for. But I like something you're going after there, though, with your question is like, so there, there's different things that the different, you know, engineers, designers, content people, it's hard for them to get their, their arms wrapped around certain concepts. Like, are we gonna lose the tone of voice for us? It's like, are we gonna lose the tone of voice in community if we do structure content and so forth? And that, that's a little bit to this sort of, I'm gonna put a book in the headline, yeah. I think. But, but so it is interesting, uh, and I'm not sure I have an answer for it, but it is very interesting to think about how everybody needs to talk about how things change, um, you know, how you're gonna change how you write. Um, but to also give confidence that we can, maybe we won't have tone of voice in the same way, 
but we'll create a different way to, to have it and, and in a way that better serves the customers. Um, but that's, yeah, that's an interesting kind of new concept you brought up of just how we all talk about the change that's going to happen from this. Uh, yeah. It's interesting that made me think to your point about when an organization leans into something like structured content where you're not always going to know what content is going to go in, into the interface and how long it's mm. going to be. That it, I mean, obviously there's many flaws with our current design tools, but it speaks to that if structured content does take off and more people start using it, it will push our current design tools or at least like things designers use to have to adapt to that at the moment they yeah. don't currently, uh, well, allow you to really build an interactive experience, right? You mostly draw pixels on a static screen that doesn't move right. and doesn't have Flexbox uh, built into the system, uh, that hopefully it will push them to have to evolve to accommodate the needs of structured content. Yeah. That's it's really egalitarian in that way, right? Everyone has to change. Everyone has to adapt mm -hmm. to each other. There's something utopian about it, which I like. She's basically describing what I built. <laughs> you should turn it into a sound. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like. <laughs> let's, all, let's all grab it. Um, I think that's it for my questions. I think also we're at time. No? I. You're the moderator. I, I know. <laughs> I, I, I think. Yeah, we just keep going. Yeah, okay, we can keep going. Um, that's fine. But yeah, my thinking is um, where do we want to go next? I mean, I think what are we inspired to do after? after we've had this conversation, what do we want to, what's our goal for structured content? Oh, for sure, I, I, I was gonna go have a beer. I, I didn't know. We were yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, what I say, yeah, I, well, first of all, I wanna learn from so many of you here. I'm, I'm very excited to be here for because I'm up here as a panelist, but I'm probably the most inexpert at structured content. So it's, it's kind of funny that way, but I think, what I could speak to is how we're wrestling with it and how we're trying to figure it out. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just really excited to meet you all, join a community of people who've done it or who are in the midst of it and, and really f sort of get your help and hopefully I can help you figure this stuff out. That's, that's what I'm getting from it. I think that like it's, there's this like education piece where people need to really rethink what that CMS is. Because I think when people think of a CMS, they're thinking of like something to build them a landing page, like mm -hmm. a blog post, right? And it, it does not need to be this. It should not be this. Like why does it, why can't it just be like a globalized piece of content? Um, why can't you just do all of your form management in something like Sanity? Why can't you do that? You can't, well you can, which is what we did. But like, like it wasn't, that was just a piece of the page that wasn't the whole thing. I wasn't going in and like selecting headers and stuff. Like we're managing very specific things globally across our entire org, but just from the way we structured it so abstract. Um, I, it's, it's really awesome and I, I'm looking forward to doing it with other, I'll just say like other third party things. I mean that one's with Marketo, but like we don't really use Marketo for that. We just submit to their endpoint um, we have everything structured in Sanity, and it's, it's on crack, I swear, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to doing more third-party stuff. I like that um, education piece. I mean, I definitely echo that, but kind of add in more of like the cultural narrative of, of structured content, not that it's um, sort of thing that needs to have a mission, but if you currently Google structured data or structured content, kind of what comes up is like a lot of uh, you know, what is like, what is tech.com articles that are very sort of like giving you very mm -hmm. rigid definitions, it's kind of for developers. And there's not a lot of storytelling in there. There's not a lot of very like exciting, um, motivating um, visions of what structured content could enable. And of course, like conferences like this help create that sort of content and put it on the internet and kind of spread the word about what the dream of this whole thing is. Uh, but I think there's a lot more to do there about storytelling really well. Um, that, and also I'd say, uh, since we're talking about cross the disciplinary collaboration and learning, is there's a really, really rich world of people who've been studying ontologies and knowledge graphs out there for quite a while, and they have a lot to say, and they're using different language to, I see this community using, but it's all kind of the same stuff. Um, so collaboration with them or learning from that world, um, I think would be really useful for people who are interested in structured content. And I think like this idea of different languages also speaks to why um, you know we maybe 
need to sort of rethink of how we how we want to move forward with structured content. People have been thinking about it for a long time in semantic web or ontologies, et cetera, but I think getting on the same page would be great. And I think we already have a language for it. I mean, Ritwick, a lot of you, you mentioned that you're sort of beginning in this as well, but I think you also have been thinking about this for a long time, yeah? Yeah, I think there's two sides to this for me. There is the, how can structured content enable the creation of these like context aware, engaging experiences that we talked about that. And I think that's been the focus, but the, the other side that I, you know, talked about being interested in is like, how does structured content actually let you get to that point or let you make these rich experiences more efficiently? So like content velocity is one way of looking at it, but how does that actually change the way you think? Um, you know, from a design point of view, having structured content be the starting point can feel like it's limiting, but I feel having that anchor, like that foundation to start off, uh, off of, can actually be freeing because now you have something that's concrete, that is shared, um, and can let you, you know, imagine or conceive of experiences that you hadn't thought of before. So I'm kind of like interested in what's happening behind the curtain and how can that how can that change the way people work fundamentally with content? Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time, everyone. Uh, really appreciate it. And I hope this was helpful for people at the conference. Stick around. We'll talk more. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.